Hey, squirrel. Sorry, I have to lean up to click my mouse. I tried reading earlier today, and I just wasn't feeling too swift. So here I am at a little after 10 bells with our Agatha Christie book, A Pocket Full of Rye, Miss Marple Mystery. And we're at chapter 24, part 1. In the train on the way down to Baden Heath, Inspector Neal had singularly little success doing the Times crossword. His mind was distracted by various possibilities. In the same way he read the news with only half his brain taking it in, he read of an earthquake in Japan. Oh, Lord, my kids are going next month. You don't want to hear about that. Of the discovery of uranium deposits in Tanganyika. Of the body of a merchant seaman washed up near Southampton. Oh, my goodness. And of the imminent strike among the dockers. He read of the latest victims of the Kosh, C-O-S-H, and of a new drug that had achieved wonders in advanced cases of tuberculosis. All these items made a queer kind of pattern in the back of his mind. Presently, he returned to the crossword puzzle and was able to put down three clues in rapid succession. When he reached Yew Tree Lodge, he had come to a certain decision. He said to Sergeant Hay, where's that old lady? Is she still there? Miss Marple? Oh, yes, she's, still, she's here still. Great buddies with the old lady upstairs. I see. Neil paused for a moment and then said, where is she now? I'd like to see her. Miss Marple arrived in a few in a few minutes' time, looking rather flushed and breathing fast. You want to see me, Inspector Neal? I do hope I haven't kept you waiting. Sergeant Hay couldn't find me at first. I was in the kitchen talking to Mrs. Crump. I was congratulating her on her pastry and how light her hand is and telling her how delicious the souffle was last night. Excuse me. Get your eyes. Uh, <clears throat> I always think, you know, it's better to approach a subject gradually, don't you? At least, I suppose it isn't so easy for you. You more or less have to come almost straight away to the questions you want to ask. But of course, for an old lady like me who has all the time in the world, as you might say, it's really expected of her that there should be a great deal of unnecessary talk. And the way to a cook's heart, as they say, is through her pastry. What you really wanted to talk to her about, said Inspector Neal, was Gladys Martin. Miss Marple nodded. Yes, Gladys. You see, Mrs. Crump could really tell me a lot about could really tell me a lot about the girl. Not in connection with the murder, I don't mean that, but about her spirits lately and the odd things she said. I don't mean odd in the sense of peculiar. I mean just the odds and ends of conversation. Did you find it helpful? Asked Inspector Neal. Yes, said Miss Marple. I found it very helpful indeed. I really think, you know, that things are becoming very much clearer, don't you? I do and I don't, said Inspector Neal. Sergeant Hay, he noticed, had left the room. He was glad of it because what he was about to do now was, to say the least of it, slightly unorthodox. Look here, Miss Marple, he said. I want to talk to you seriously. Yes, Inspector Neal? In a way, said Inspector Neal, you and I represent different points of view. I admit, Miss Marple, that I've heard something about you at the yard. He smiled. It seems you're fairly well known there. I don't know how it is, fluttered Miss Marple, but I so often seem to get mixed up in the things that are really no concern of mine. Crimes, I mean, and peculiar happenings. You've got a reputation, said Inspector Neal. Sir Henry Clithering, of course, said Miss Marple, is a very old friend of mine. As I said before, Neil went on, you and I represent opposite points of view. One might almost call them sanity and insanity. 
Miss Marple put her head a little on one side. Now, what exactly do you mean by that, I wonder, Inspector? Well, Miss Marple, there's a sane way of looking at things. This murder benefits certain people. One person, I may say, in particular. The second murder benefits the same person. The third murder one might call a murder for safety. But which do you call the third murder, Miss Marple asked. Her eyes, a very bright china blue, looked shrewdly at the inspector. He nodded. Yes, you've got something there, perhaps. You know, the other day when the A.C. was speaking to me of these murders, something that he said seemed to me to be wrong. That was it. I was thinking, of course, of the nursery rhyme. The king in his counting house, the queen in the parlor, and the maid hanging out the clothes. Exactly, said Miss Marple, a sequence in that order, but actually Gladys. Must have been murdered before, Mrs. Fortescue, mustn't she? I think so, said Neil. I take it. It's quite certainly so. Her body wasn't discovered till late that night. And of course, it was difficult then to say exactly how long she'd been dead. But I think myself that she must almost certainly have been murdered round about five o'clock because otherwise... Miss Marple cut in, because otherwise she would certainly have taken the second tray into the drawing room. Quite so. She took one tray in with the tea on it. She brought the second tray into the hall, and then something happened. She saw something or heard something. The question is what that something was. It might have been Dubois coming down the stairs from Mrs. Fortescue's room. It might have been Elaine Fortescue's young man, Gerald Wright, coming in at the side door. Whoever it was lured her away from the tea tray and out into the garden. And once that had happened, I don't see any possibility of her death being long delayed. It was cold out, and she was only wearing her thin uniform. Of course, you're quite right, said Miss Marple. I mean, it was never a case of the maid was in the garden hanging up the clothes. She wouldn't be hanging up clothes at that time of the evening, and she wouldn't go out to the clothesline without putting a coat on. That was all camouflage, like the clothes peg to make the thing fit in with the rhyme. Exactly, said Inspector Neil. Crazy, that's where I can't yet see eye to eye with you. I can't, I simply can't swallow this nursery rhyme business. But it fits, Inspector. You must agree it fits. It fits, said Neil heavily, but all the same, the sequence is wrong. I mean, the rhyme definitely suggests that the maid was the third murder, but we know that, that the queen was the third murder. Adele Fortescue was not killed until between... 25 past 5 and 5 minutes to 6. By then, Gladys must already have been dead. And that's all wrong, isn't it, said Miss Marple. All wrong for the nursery rhyme. That's very significant, isn't it? Inspector Neal shrugged his shoulders. It's probably splitting hairs. The deaths fulfill the conditions of the rhyme. And I suppose that's all that was needed, but I'm talking now as though I were on your side. I'm going to outline my side of the case now, Miss Marple. I'm washing out the blackbirds and the rye and all the rest of it. I'm going by sober facts and common sense and the reasons for which sane people do murders. First, the death of Rex Fortescue and who benefits by his death? Well, it benefits quite a lot of people, but most of all, it benefits his son, Percival. His son, Percival, wasn't at U Tree Lodge that morning. <clears throat> he couldn't have put poison in his father's coffee or in anything that he ate for breakfast, or that's what we thought at first. Ah, Miss Marple's eyes brightened, so there was a method, was there? I've been thinking about it, you know, a good deal. And I've had several ideas, but of course no evidence or proof. 
there's no harm in my letting you know, said Inspector Neal. Taxine was added to a new jar of marmalade. That jar of marmalade was placed on the breakfast table, and the top layer of it was eaten by Mr. Fortescue at breakfast. Later, that jar of marmalade was thrown out into the bushes, and a similar jar with a similar amount taken out of it was placed <clears throat> in the pantry. The jar in the bushes was found, and I've just had the result of the analysis. It shows definite evidence of taxine. So that was it, murmured Miss Marple, so simple and easy to do. Consolidated investments, Neil went on, was in it. <clears throat> Sorry, and I didn't bring anything to drink in here. Consolidated investments, Neil went on, was in a bad way. If the firm had had to pay out, a hundred thousand pounds to Adele Fortescue under her husband's will, it would, I think, have crashed if Miss Mrs. Fortescue had survived her husband for a month. That money would have had to be paid out to her. She would have had no feeling for the firm or its difficulties, but she didn't survive her husband for a month. She died, and as a result of her death, the gainer was the residuary legatee of Rex Fortescue's will. In other words, Percival Fortescue again. Always Percival Fortescue, the inspector continued bitterly, and though he could have tampered with the marmalade, he couldn't have poisoned his stepmother or strangled Gladys. According to his secretary, he was in his city office at five o'clock that afternoon, and he didn't arrive back here until nearly seven. That makes it very different, no difficult, doesn't it, said Miss Marple. It makes it impossible, said Inspector Neal gloomily. In other words, Percival is out, abandoning restraint, restraint and prudence. He spoke with some bitterness almost unaware of his listener wherever i go wherever i turn i always come up against the same person percival fortescue yet it can't be percival fortescue calming himself a little he said oh there are other possibilities other people who had a perfectly good motive mr dubois of course said miss marple sharply and that young mr wright I do so agree with you, Inspector. Whatever there is, wherever there is a question of gain, one has to be very suspicious. The great thing to avoid is having, in any way, a trustful mind. In spite of himself, Neil smiled. I always think the worst, eh? he asked. It seemed a curious doctrine to be proceeding from this charming and fragile-looking old lady. Oh, yes, said Miss Marple fervently. I always believe the worst. What is so sad is that one is usually justified in doing so. All right, said Neil. Let's think the worst. Dubois could have done it. Gerald Wright could have done it. That is to say... If he had been acting in collusion with Elaine Fortescue and she tampered with the marmalade. Mrs. Percival could have done it. I suppose she was on the spot, but none of the people I've mentioned tie up with the crazy angle. They don't tie, <clears throat> tie up with the blackbirds in pockets full of rye. That's your theory, and it may be that you're right. If so, it boils down to one person, doesn't it? Mrs. McKenzie's in a mental home and has been for a good number of years. She hasn't been messing about with marmalade pots or putting cyanide in the drawing room afternoon tea. Her son Donald was killed at Dunkirk. That leaves the daughter, Ruby. And if your theory is correct, if this whole series of murders arises out of the old Blackbird mine business, then Ruby McKenzie must be the must be here in this house and there's only one person that ruby mckenzie could be i think you know said miss marple 
I wonder if it's that this dove. Uh, that you're being a little too dogmatic. That was Miss Marple. Inspector Neal paid no attention. Just one person, he said grimly. He got up and went out of the room. Part two. Mary Dove was in her sitting room. It was small, <clears throat> a small, rather a sturdy furnished room, but comfortable. That is to say, Miss Dove herself had made it comfortable. When Inspector Neal tapped at the door, Mary Dove raised her head, which had been bit, bent over a pile of tradesmen's books and said in a clear voice, Come in. The inspector entered. Do sit down, Inspector, Miss Dove indicated a chair. Could you wait just one moment? The total of the total of the fishmonger's account does not seem to be correct, and I must check it. Inspector Neal sat in silence, watching her as she toted up the column. How wonderfully calm and self-possessed the girl was, he thought. He was intrigued, and so often before, by the personality that underlay that self-assured manner. He tried to trace in her features any resemblance to those of the woman he had talked to at the Pinewood Sanatorium. The coloring was not alike, but he could detect no real facial resemblance. Presently, Mary Dove raised her head from her accounts and said, Yes, Inspector, what can I do for you? Inspector Neal said quietly, You know, Miss Dove, there are certain... Certain very peculiar features about this case. Yes, to begin with, there's the odd circumstance of the rye found in Mr. Fortescue's pocket. That was very extraordinary, Mary Dove agreed. You know, I cannot really think of any explanation for that. Then there is the curious circumstance of the blackbirds. Those four blackbirds on Mr. Fortescue's desk last summer, and also the incidents, the incident of the blackbirds being substituted for the veal and ham and the pie. You were here, I think, Miss Dove, at the, at the time of both those occurrences. <laughs> yes, I was. I remember now. It was most upsetting. It seemed such a very it seems such a very purposeless spiteful thing to do especially at the time perhaps not entirely purposeless what do you know miss dove about the blackbird mine i don't think i've ever heard of the blackbird mine your name you told me is mary dove is that your real name miss dove mary raised her eyebrows <clears throat> Inspector Neal was almost sure that a wary expression had come into her blue eyes. What an extraordinary question, Inspector. Are you suggesting that my name is not Mary Dove? That's exactly what I am suggesting. I'm suggesting, said Neal pleasantly, that your name is Ruby McKenzie. She stared at him. For a moment, her face was entirely blank with neither protest on it nor surprise. There was, Inspector Neal thought, a very delicate effect of calculation. After a minute or two, she said in a quiet, colorless voice, What do you expect me to say? Please answer me. Is your name Ruby McKenzie? I told you my name is Mary Dove. Yes, but have you proof of that, Miss Dove? <clears throat> what do you want to see, my birth certificate? That might be helpful, or it might not. You might, I mean, be in possession of the birth certificate of a Mary Dove. That Mary Dove might be a friend of yours, or might be someone who, who had died. Yes, there are a lot of possibilities, aren't there? Amusement had crept back into Mary's, Mary Dove's voice. It's really quite a dilemma for you, isn't it, Inspector? 
They might possibly be able to recognize you at Pinewood Sanatorium, said Neil. Pinewood Sanatorium. Harry raised her eyebrow. What or where is Pinewood Sanatorium? I think you know very well, Miss Dove. I assure you I am quite in the dark. And you deny categorically that you are Ruby McKenzie? I shouldn't really like to deny anything. I think you know, Inspector, that it's up to you to prove I am this Ruby McKenzie, whoever she is. There was a definite amusement now in her blue eyes. Amazing? No. Amusement and challenge. Looking him straight in the eyes, Mary Dove said, Yes, it's up to you, Inspector. Prove that I'm Ruby McKenzie if you can. And that's all. So next time we'll be at chapter 25. Be sweet. Don't be ugly.